Welcome back to the Vanessa G Fit Cast. I'm Vanessa Pozos, and here with me is Omar Pozos, my husband and lovely co-host. And today we have on a very, very special guest who I am very excited to have on the show today. Truly a dream. We have Sal Stefano on the podcast live with us. Sal, for those of you who do not know who he is, give a little bit of background here. So he actually started as a professional in the fitness industry as a trainer at the young age of 18. And his passion for fitness combined with his love of people and really, truly helping people really quickly propelled him into just really a lot of success. He moved into a big box gym management by the time he was 19 years old. During his career in gym management, he uh, grand opened some of the largest gyms in the California Bay Area and was often recognized as a top performer in sales, production, team leadership, really earning a, a ton of accolades in the industry. Then after decades of running his studio, he met Doug, who is now the current producer of Mind Pump, which is where many of you may be familiar with Sal's name from. And shortly after, he met Adam Schaefer and Justin Andrews, and they quickly hit it off, even with their, you know, their different backgrounds, but having the similar approaches to fitness, to health, they ultimately decided to start a fitness and health podcast, which is Mind Pump. Mind Pump launched and quickly became the number one fitness and health podcast in the world. Currently, Sal is one of the most sought after experts in the fitness and health industry, and I can attest to that as it's not easy to get him on your podcast, but we're, we're very happy to have done so. But his just really effective, really grounded and easy to understand style of communication has really led to a lot of his success there. He's been on hundreds of top podcast shows and frequently speaks at trainer and health practitioner events, and his passion for fitness, health, people, it is truly just unmatched. And just with his goal of making the fitness industry one that is a force for good with long-term health being the focus and not, not an industry that is riddled with diet pills, crash diets, false promises, those types of things. So Sal really does a really incredible job of sharing the raw truths of how to build a lean toned body with science and facts, but truly in a way that's also digestible and not intimidating for beginners or for those who are, are just getting started in their fitness industry and maybe have never heard of Sal, maybe never heard of Mind Pump. So that's why we are extremely excited to have him on the podcast live with us today. But Sal, welcome to the show. Yeah. Hey, thank you so much. That was a very nice intro. I appreciate all the kind words, but thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, Sal, there's so many things that we would love to talk to you about. And for our listeners here, a little bit of uh, context for you. I was just telling Sal before we hit record that a lot of the reason that I am here today, the reason we have a podcast, the reason we have a coaching business really does come back to the things that I had learned in my early days in listening to Mind Pump and listening to Sal and the whole team there. And I, you know, had gone through my own health and fitness journey, as our listeners know. And a lot of that, you know, day after day, I was just consuming so much content from Mind Pump. I really felt like I was part of the group listening in. And eventually I found myself realizing that I had a passion to want to share these things the way that they were sharing with others, the way they were putting out really quality free information. I wanted to do the same. And that's the basis that led to me ultimately putting out free information that led to women asking me to help them and coach them. And fast forward to today, we have a very successful coaching business because of it. So things really do come full circle. But Sal, your personal approach to health and fitness is one that I absolutely admire because we, we share very similar mentalities. And one quote that you know I've heard you say is, exercise and eat right because you love your body, not because you hate your body. So I think I want to start there. Maybe tell us a little bit about what that quote really means to you and you know what makes you say something like that. Well, there's, there's uh, first off, I want to make a comment. Um, it's, uh, it's, really, it's really humbling to see people like yourself get into the space inspired um, from some of the things that we say on our show. We don't communicate things in the same way that most of the fitness industry does. And one of our goals uh, was and still is to inspire others to either get in the fitness industry or people who are in the industry to kind of change their approach so that we could do things the right way. I think um, uh, if you look at the many of the problems that plague modern societies, the chronic health issues, and even the, the chronic mental health issues, 
many of those things could be solved uh, by some of the, the methods and answers that you'll find in the fitness industry. Unfortunately, it's, it tends to be buried under a lot of terrible information and, and marketing and, and stuff like that. But, but it's there and, and really good coaches and trainers are the ones that are really doing this. And, and I know this because I was, I was a trainer for, for decades before I, I did Mind Pump. And I know the impact that I had as a trainer versus the impact I might have now. And it's just, uh, it's, you know, maybe I could reach more people, but it's not as deep and as profound as when I was a trainer. So when I hear someone like you say that, you know, we inspired you, um, I, I love that because I know that we're able to now, it looks like we're starting to shift things a little bit. It's a big shift. It's hard to turn, um, but it feels good to see that. Um, okay. So exercise and eat right because you love your body, not because you hate your body. Well, that came from, a, uh, there's, there's two reasons why I communicate that. One is, um, I think it's it's quite obvious, maybe not, uh, but to, to those of us in the space, it's obvious that a lot of us are initially motivated um, to exercise or eat right because of insecurities, um, motivated by self-hate. You know, I'm fat, I'm gross, I'm not attractive, I'm inadequate. Um, and, and that drives us initially to go to the gym. It drives us initially to change our eating habits and our lifestyle. But what happens through that is that we end up developing a relationship with both exercise and nutrition that is um, not only not healthy, but unsustainable, right? So exercise becomes a punishment when you hate yourself, right? When you, if you feel like you're fat and you hate yourself and you go to the gym, beating yourself up feels cathartic at first. Like, yes, this is what I deserve. Like, this is what I need. I can barely crawl out of the gym. What a great workout, right? Now, those of us who are trainers know that that's a terrible workout. You've You've trained yourself inappropriately, but it feels cathartic to the person who hates themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then you develop a relationship with exercise where it's a punishment. At some point, you don't want to punish yourself anymore and you end up stopping. That's what happens to a lot of people. Second, with diet, um, diet becomes restrictive when you hate yourself, right? It's, it's people offer you food or you see a menu and you go, I can't have that. I can't have that because uh, I'm whatever, I'm gross or whatever, right? So it's like with, with, it's like, uh, restricting myself from these things because I don't deserve to have them type of deal. It's the attitude people tend to have. So diet becomes restrictive. So it's no wonder that people say things like, um, you know, I stopped working out and I stopped trying to eat better because I want to enjoy my life. Right. You hear that all the time. I remember when I heard that years ago, I was at a, a, a dinner function with some, with a tech company. And I heard a woman across from me say that um, she was, she wasn't going to work out and eat and, and watch her diet because she just wanted to enjoy her life. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, I've heard that before, but it really struck me uh, that at that moment, and I thought, what a strange thing if you really think about it, because being fit and healthy um, will improve the quality and the enjoyment of everything in your life. I mean, I don't care what you do, pick it, uh, you know, being a parent, being an employee, a boss, sleeping, uh, you, know, uh, you know, connecting with people. I mean, I don't care what it is, if you're fit and healthy, and vibrant, it's, it, it's more enjoyable. Life is more enjoyable. Mm. And yet this person is saying, I'm not going to do the things that will make things more enjoyable so I can enjoy my life. And that's because exercise to her, uh, many people, was a punishment and eating right was restrictive. So eating and exercising because you love your body changes that approach, right? Now, I, when I go to the gym, by the way, this is not, this doesn't mean I'm lying because I think a lot of people think uh, well, I don't want to, you know, be dishonest. Like I don't like the way I look or I don't like the way I feel. How do I love myself? Right. Well, it's, um, love is an action. I'm not talking about the feeling, by the way, the, the feeling of love is like the, the smell of the Turkey dinner. It's not the Turkey dinner at Thanksgiving as Arthur Brooks, uh, would say, um, it's, it's the potential evidence of, of the action of love. So when I say love your body, it's through action. So you can look in the mirror and say, you know, I don't, I haven't been taking care of myself. Like I haven't really been caring for myself in the ways that I should. And now my body reflects that my energy reflects that, right? So now, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change that. And I'm going to go to the gym. And I'm going to take care of myself, like somebody that deserves to be taken care of, I'm going to love myself. So what that leads to first off is appropriate exercise, because beating the crap out of yourself, making yourself feel like you're throwing up, like you're going to throw up or you're so sore that you can't walk. Uh, that wouldn't, that would not be caring for yourself, right? You, you wouldn't, you wouldn't do that to somebody you cared about. <laughs> you would say that, well, that's too much. That's inappropriate. That's not going to get you faster results either. So number one, it gives you um, a better approach or more appropriate, but then you develop a relationship with exercise where it's self-care. 
And then diet becomes a relationship where it's nourishment. It's no longer, I can't have those things. It's, I don't want those things, or I do want those things. Again, honesty is, is, is a part of this. So I could look at a food, you know, I could look at pizza, for example, and say to myself, like, yeah, I know it tastes good. I know it's going to be enjoyable to eat, but I actually don't want it because I know how it feels afterwards, or I know uh, the things I'm trying to do for myself and my body and my health. So I, yes, it'll taste good, but I don't want it. Just like, uh, you know, you may look at, you may look at an illegal drug and say, it's probably going to feel good to do that, but I'm not going to do that because I care about myself and I don't want to, you know, do that drug or whatever, right? Or any other action that, you know, is not going to necessarily be, be uh, something that you would do for yourself if you cared for yourself. So it develops a relationship that's, that's not long, that's now long-term. So rather than punishing yourself with exercise, restricting yourself with diet, which eventually leads to rebellion, because at some point what happens is along that journey, you, you rebel from the tyranny of yourself is what ends up happening. So this is why people don't just go off their diet a little bit. They go way off. It's like, oh my God, I went off my diet yesterday. Well, what happened? I ate a pint of ice cream and a whole large, you know, box of cookies, right? Um, that's what rebellion looks like, where the pendulum goes too far in the opposite direction and you just, you, you go crazy. Um, caring for yourself is it's much more balanced and it feels good. It feels good in the sense that you're doing something that you want to do for yourself because you're caring for yourself. So that's one reason why I communicate that. But here's the other reason why I communicate what you're saying is it's a good sales pitch. It's a nice short way of selling this idea. And I typically will pair that with another thing that I say, which is if you chase aesthetics, you'll lose your health and then you'll lose your aesthetics. If you chase health, you'll gain a great deal of, 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 of aesthetics through good health. Mm. So part of the, one of the things I learned uh, as a trainer was how to sell the right ideas better than the other guys can sell the wrong ideas. And that's not easy because when you're selling things the wrong way, essentially lying or taking advantage of people's insecurities, like I could say almost anything. Like I could say, um, do my diet and my crazy workout and take these diet pills. And in 30 days, you'll lose 30 pounds. Like I could say that cause I don't care. I have no integrity and I'm lying. I mean, that's alluring to somebody who really hates themselves in that moment. They would get out of their body so fast that they're like 30 days. Okay. I, I, I got to get out of this. Well, how in the heck am I going to sell that person the idea that it's probably going to take a year? It's going to be a, 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 a shift in lifestyle. It's going to be a bit of a journey. It's a struggle. Um, and, but we're going to grow through this, right? Um, how do I sell them that over the other one? Well, I got to be able to pitch it better. So that's the other reason why you hear those, those quotes is because we got to fight fire with fire. And, um, you know, it took me a long time to figure that out as a trainer. Cause when you train people for as long as I did, I mean, you said it was, you know, you, you said it when you introed me, I was 18 I and mean, I was back in 1997. It, it was a long time of me trial and error, trial and error, trial and error. Uh, of communicating the same thing over and over again in different ways and then finding the thing that really, oh, this is what's resonating. Now I'm being effective. So what you hear in the podcast is decades of trial and error of, uh, of communicating those things. And, and that's just, that's, that's, that's exactly where those things came from. Yeah. And thank you so much for even sharing that stuff with us, Sal. Um, I, I, I want to piggy off of that, what you were just saying of, you know, decades of you guys being, in the gym floors, training people, knowing this stuff inside and out. And you're right, when you're fi fighting fire with fire, unfortunately for us on the other side, the fire from the gimmicks, the marketing, all that stuff is quite a large fire. So we have a lot of quick fad diets, quick promises that are promising a lot of these unsustainable results. So given your experience to, especially for the, the, the listeners for our show, it's a lot of women, um, particular women that are probably stressed, you know, high achievers, or they have a lot on their plates. And so you're right, they do tend to fall prey to a lot of these extreme diets or exhausting workout routines in, in that pursuit of their ideal body. For for you, how can you reassure some of these women, some of these listeners that are maybe stuck in that cycle that's a little bit yeah. unsustainable, uh, that there is a healthier, but also much more effective way to achieve some of the, the, the fitness goals that they have? All right. In short, you have to sell it better. Uh, this, is what, this is what we train coaches and trainers all the time. We have a trainer co course that we just put out. I don't know if you guys have seen it or you have it. 
Um, but uh, in there, we talk a lot about this because I think this is a missing component in most courses and uh, certifications is, is talking about this. You have to sell it better, but there's, there's, a, there's a formula to it, right? So you have to tell people uh, what they've experienced, what they're going to experience. Here's what you're probably going to see so that you, when they do see it, if they don't take your advice, they're like, oh, oh God, he told me about this. But then you have to, and you also have to be very honest, always, always be very honest and fight the temptation to tell the person what they want to hear. Mm. Fight that temptation. There's nothing will get a client to fail uh, more effectively than overselling or what should I say? Overpromising. Okay. Uh, oh, you want to lose 30 pounds in 30 days? Yeah, we could totally do that. You know, you just got to follow everything I do, do everything perfect type of deal. Like, you're going to set them up uh, for failure. So be very honest, be very vulnerable and authentic, and then learn how to sell uh, those ideas better. Okay, so you want to work out seven days a week. You want to go do F45 or some HIIT style class. Um, here's what's going to happen to your body, and here's what you're going to experience when you do that, right? So that high calorie output combined with a calorie deficit, um, you know, taking in less calories than you're burning, and you're burning a lot of calories initially, is going to tell your body, hey, uh, we need to learn how to burn less calories to make up the difference. And so what's going to end up happening, and the data shows this, is that you will lose roughly half of the body weight that you lose uh, will come from muscle. Now, what that means is you're going to be smaller, but you're going to be just as fat as you are now. You're going to be smaller, but the same essentially flabbiness. But that's not it. Um, you also have now a slower metabolism. It's your body's attempt at trying to slow its metabolism down to become more efficient. So here's what you'll experience by doing something like that. You'll get this initial very fast weight loss, but then you're going to plateau really hard. And then you'll be met with this uh, question right here. Do I cut my calories further or do I exercise more or do both? And then if you do that, you'll get another jump in weight loss on the scale. Remember half of it coming from muscle. And then you'll plateau again. And then you'll have to ask your, yourself this question. Do I want to exercise more? And do I want to eat less? Now that leads to an unsustainable place. At some point, you're going to be like, this is just, I have another 10 pounds to go. And I am working out like crazy. I feel like I'm putting all this work in and getting very little results. Now, if you approach this the way that I advocate for, what we're going to try to do is teach your body to burn more calories. Um, and that means we're going to send the signal to build muscle. And, I'm, and we're going to fuel that. We're going to fuel that through adequate calories and nutrition. Now, the initial weight loss on the scale is not going to happen as fast, but you will lose body fat. In fact, the, the data shows that, the, that you'll lose all body fat. You'll lose no muscle. In fact, you may gain muscle. You probably will because you're not working out now. So that means you're going to have a faster metabolism. This is more of a snowball effect where the weight loss and the fat loss starts to happen faster and faster and faster. And oftentimes, people at the end of this journey have a metabolism that's faster than when they started. You know what that means? That means you can eat more to maintain your leaner body. And then I, I would also get in and explain, uh, you know, how dense muscle is in comparison to body fat. You know, you, you, your muscle on a pound for pound basis takes up maybe a little more than three fourths of the space of body fat. In other words, if you lost uh, 10 pounds of body fat, but gained 10 pounds of muscle, you would weigh the same, but you would look very different and you'd be smaller, right? So, you have to explain these things, but then you also have to be very honest. Also, it's going to be hard. Here's why it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard because changing your eating habits isn't as easy as just not eating certain things and eating other things. This is a fundamental part of who we are as people. Um, your diet isn't just uh, calories and nutrients, but your diet, the foods that you eat are things you eat because you're sad or happy or celebrating or mourning or because you're in a particular environment, you eat this particular type of food because you're at the movies or you're at a birthday party or whatever. And so this isn't just, you know, white knuckling, hey, I'm going to change this fundamental part of myself and it's going to stick. This, we have to change your relationship to food, which is a bit of a process. But I will say this, this is the only way to do it mm -hmm. in a long-term permanent way. In other words, it, the, 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 the options are not, I lose weight fast or I lose it slow. The options are I lose weight or I don't. In other words, there's only one way to do this. The other way, and again, the data shows this, you will gain the weight back. You will end up worse than where you started. Now, if you want to lose it and gain it back, then go ahead and do what you've done before. But if you want to fix that problem, never run into that again, then follow me. And, and so, uh, you know, what I'm doing essentially is I'm, I'm speaking the truth. 
I'm not uh, over promising. I'm communicating what's going to happen because then when the experience of like he told me about this, um, but I'm also speaking with confidence and I'm asking for trust and people want that. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. when people get on this journey, what they don't want to hear is a trainer that is coming across as a little um, inauthentic. And they also definitely don't want to hear a trainer that sounds like they're not confident. Like, would you walk through a dark jungle with a guide who's like, well, you know, maybe we'll find our way. I'm not sure. Like, you want to be like, listen, follow me. You're not going to get hurt. Keep your hand on me. I know where I'm going. And then they start walking. You're going to grab onto the shirt and be like, all right, they know where they're going. So that's the combination of things that, that you'll find success with. And then, of course, along the journey, while you're working with this individual, the, the, the hardest, I don't want to say the hardest, the, the, the things you need to focus on are when the person struggles or stumbles. Many times they struggle with them. Their, it's themselves, not really the lack of progress, but rather their own psychology and what's going on. And if they do, you know, struggle with taking certain steps, you want to move them away from the shame cycle that tends to follow that. You know, the shame cycle looks like this. Um, oh man, I missed yesterday's workout. Okay, that's a fact. Here's 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 the shame cycle. What an idiot. I'm so lazy. Mm-hmm. I always do that. What is wrong with me? Okay. Um, that shame cycle leads to the very behaviors that has put this person in the situation in the first place. When you look at the eating habits, for example, of people who deal with obesity, many of the times they're eating these foods, it's to self-medicate from some kind of negative feeling, whether it be anxiety, depression, or, or, or discomfort. That shame cycle, that just you're adding fuel to that fire. You are literally, whatever it is that's making them want to self-medicate with that temporary feeling of, yes, this feels good for the, for the moment. Whatever it is that's driving that, you're, they're adding to that with those layers of shame. So it's very important as a coach and a guide when that happens to say, yeah, you did miss yesterday's workout. Uh, that wasn't ideal, but that happens to a lot of people. And we'll get back on track. It's not as bad as you think it is. I know it sucks, but don't worry. This is a journey and there's going to be a lot of stumbling blocks. Let's get back on this. Let's try this again. I have uh, a lot of trust in you. I know you can do this. And and if you mess up again, that's fine. We'll start again. Like you want that person. You don't want to add to that person's shame spiral. I think it's one of the most most, uh, important things you could do as a coach. And then that person grows through this process. Like for a person to go from inactive, 30 pounds overweight, to regularly active, healthy, fit, and mobile, that transformation is a lot more than just their body. There's an in, inner transformation uh, that has to occur. So as a trainer, as a coach, uh, you are guiding this person through um, this process. And it's it's way more than here's your exercises and, and here's your diet. Yeah. I mean, man, I uh, take it from Sal, not Vanessa or myself, but, you know, there is a much more sustainable way to do this stuff. There is a a way to lose the weight and actually keep it off instead of being stuck in the same cycle over and over. And um, one of the things that I I just love your approach to, you know, it's not just a X's and O's, you know, everybody gets the same script, everybody gets the same nutrition program. It's very individualized. And that's what we always like to to, to harp on is, you know, everybody is a little bit different. Their dieting history, their habits, their their lifestyle, it all has to be customized to make sense for them. Otherwise, you, again, you continue to spin the wheels with, you know, no end in sight, essentially. Yeah, we, we, um, we underestimate the complexity of our relationship with uh, our bodies, uh, but definitely with uh, our diets. Like this is like, we in the fitness industry tend to look at food, by the way, the reason why it's this is it's this way from the fitness industry is the people that tend to get the, the biggest loud, you know, the, the, the biggest loudspeakers, the most attention tend to be the most body obsessed, dysfunctional mm-hmm. people in our space. So, so they look ripped, right? They look whatever. Um, but what you'll find uh, under the hood is somebody who's orthorexic or really using exercise as a coping mechanism and has a very dysfunctional relationship with diet. So what they'll do is they'll communicate through that. And you'll hear things like food is fuel, right? Uh, or just, you know, just follow the plan, like, you know, whatever, right? Um, food isn't just fuel. That's such a small piece of what food is. Food is a lot of things. Uh, it's not just fuel. 
And so the process is developing a different relationship with food. So to go a little deeper with that, the relationship that we tend to have with food, most people have with food in modern societies is really revolves around two main things. Uh, how enjoyable this food is to eat, which we, we would refer to as, as, as palatability, how palatable the food is. So that's the experience, right? The hedonistic value of food, the taste, the smell, the experience of it. So that's the most, that's like the biggest value that we slap on food. And then the second one's convenience. Now, and so what happens is our information is incomplete. It's like food is palatability, convenience, but there's this whole other area that remains dark to us because we've never allowed ourselves to become fully aware of all of the other values that foods provide us. So to give you an example, if someone's allergic of a food, to a food, like literally like anaphylactic shock, right? They eat something and they get like really sick. They're not going to eat that food, right? Because it's a very strong signal. But there's a lot of weaker signals that we tend to ignore because we're told to ignore them or because we're told it's normal or because maybe we use over the counter, you know, medications or stimulants or things. But look, their food affects uh, how you feel, not just physically, but emotionally. There's also how you feel before you eat the food. So there's different feelings you'll have before you eat a particular food. There's how the foods affect your sleep, your digestion, um, how they affect your skin, your hair, your nails, how it affects your athletic performance, your mental performance. The problem is that we don't look at those things or we don't make ourselves aware enough to develop a relationship with food where we can make decisions based off of complete information. So I'll give an example to illustrate what I'm talking about because someone might be like, what are you talking about? Who is two, the crazy uh, guy on the podcast? <laughs> yeah, I'll, two things, two things. One, this used to happen to, with me all the time. I'm sure you guys run into this, right? Well, I'll have a client I'll look at, you know, I'll get their information and I'll see on there. Oh, okay. I see that you take, uh, you know, an antacid every day at, you know, at 4 p.m. You take Tums every day at 4 p.m. Oh, yeah, I have heartburn. It's genetic, blah, 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 whatever. And then we'd end up going through their diet and we like, oh, it's that turkey sandwich that you have every day for lunch. And they'll be like, oh, my God, I had no idea. I had no idea that that was causing that. So incomplete information. Now they've developed a different relationship with that turkey sandwich. Now it's like, I like it. Tastes good. Have it every day. Gives me heartburn. You know, maybe maybe my decisions will be a little different. Like that's a silly example. But here's the the, the second thing I was going to say that illustrates what I'm talking about. Right? There's this famous study, and I'm about to give it away. Uh, so when you watch it on YouTube now, you'll know this. But hopefully, a lot of people are familiar with this. But it's a real study. It's been duplicated many times. I think the first time they did this was in the 1960s or 70s. But anyway, there's a video you can find it on YouTube, where there's a group of 12 people, I think, and they're passing a basketball between each other. And the instructor says, count how many times the basketball is being passed. And so they're passing the ball and the one guy passes it behind his back. Another guy throws it behind his back and they're doing all these funny passes and you're counting, you're counting, you're counting. And at the end of it, he says, okay, you guys ready? And you're like, yeah. And he's like, did you see the gorilla walking through the crowd? And you're like, what? They rewind the tape and literally as people are passing the basketball, there's a person in a gorilla suit that walks right through the frame, right through the group of people that are passing the basketball. And about 80% of people don't even notice the gorilla walking through the crowd because we don't see what we don't focus on or what we're not looking at. So when we don't have, when we're not allowing or making ourselves aware of all of these, these, these potential values or, or, or factors that food provides for us or how it affects us, we're really only making decisions off the ones we're aware of, which are palatability and convenience. This is why when people will get together for lunch, they'll say things like, um, you know, what do you want for lunch? Oh, I feel like, you know, Mexican. What do you feel like? Oh, I feel like this. Like, what are they basing their decision off of? Right. When you start to, to, to write and it, it's a, it's a, it's a pro it's a, it's a process because you have to initially make yourself conscious and aware of these things. You have to write things down. Like, okay, how do I feel right now? And then why are you eating it? Like, how do I feel now? And then afterwards, you know, an hour later, and what do I notice at night? And you got to start making these connections. But then what happens is you start to, to, to crave foods for different values, not just for the palatability. You'll find like, oh man, uh, you know, tomorrow I'm going to go on the hike. You know what? I, you know, oh yeah, let me eat that. There's that, you know, that meal that I eat that tends to give me a lot of fuel and energy or this macro profile that gives me energy for that. Or, 
you know, like for me, like if I go down to, sometimes I'll go down to Los Angeles here or Austin and I'll do like a podcast circuit. Um, I know there's a particular way that I eat that I get better performance on the podcast, which is different than the way I'll eat if I want performance in the gym, which is different than the way I'll eat when I notice digestive issues or stress and anxiety, right? So, and you'll, you'll want those things. You'll actually crave those foods. Like when I come back from a long trip, I crave foods that tend to affect my digestion in a positive way because it tends to get affected negatively. So I'll come home and, my, and I'll tell my wife, like, I really want well-cooked vegetables and some fish, right? Um, now I know that, you know, a hamburger and fries will taste better, but that's what I want <laughs> because I've, I've created a more full picture mm-hmm. of, of, the, of the values that these foods uh, have provided. So, by the way, this is, like, uh, um, this is like a microcosm of life, you know? Like, you guys are married. You're both young, attractive. Like, it, you know, if you develop this through your relationship, you will find each other attractive when you're 80, Right. When we're not supposed to be, as, but you, but why? Because you'll, you'll have this complete picture of value. Like, oh, that's my wife or my husband. There's, we've done this life together. We've raised these kids and I, I love their personality, whatever. So you, you can do this with food, but it is a bit of a process. But when you do this, here's why I'm saying this. Okay. If you, if you have a complete picture of all of the values of food and you're doing it to care for yourself, you will want to eat healthy. Okay. So it is not going to be this white knuckle, like, oh, i got to restrict myself. My God, I'm craving those cookies. I can't eat those. And oh, it's going to be relaxed. Mm-hmm. It's going to feel this is how you eat now. This is the way that I eat. I eat to nourish my body, which to add a little balance here, sometimes means you eat those cookies. Sometimes means you have that pizza. Like if you're going to, you know, for me, like I go to a birthday party and I'm celebrating with my kids. Uh, having cake is a part of taking care of myself in that moment. So balance becomes baked into the formula. But if you don't approach it that way, uh, this is why uh, we're screwed. This is why it's, this is why the, 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 the fail rate with diets, any diet, I don't care what diet it is, is, is north of 90%. So you're telling me millions of people lo- lose weight every year, literally in America, millions of people, and they all gain it back. Are they all lazy? Are they all in discipline? No, like these are, these are professionals. These are executives. These are successful individuals and in other aspects of their life. Why are they failing? We are not working with a complete knowledge and understanding of the true values of food. And we haven't developed a relationship with food where it's not going to be a complete struggle 24 seven. If it's a struggle 24 seven, if it's a stress, you're going to fail or you'll become an orthorexic, which is not healthy either. And we see that again in my space. hundred percent. And Gosh, I mean, listening to you talk about all these things, I think any any listener of our show right now who has been a longtime listener of our podcast or has been a, a client of our coaching program, Vital Spark, they're definitely understanding us better having heard that I got my start after listening to my pump <laughs> because we are, are very aligned in all of our, our thought processes, Sal. And, you know, a big part of our coaching program is we do take that slow, sustainable route. And what a lot of that means is truly starting with a lot of the mindset work. You know, I was talking with a, a client today and, you know, she was like, gosh, like, I, I feel like I, you know, might ask something or might, you know, tell you about something and you come back with so many questions and we kind of like, you end up giving me a lot of questions more so than answers sometimes. And she's asking, you know, why is that? I'm like, well, because I could give you the answer. I could tell you, hey, you know, go do this, go eat that you know, here's the solution to your problems, do these things. And it might work for you for a day. It might work for you for a month. But the reality is being told what to do and even being told how to do it isn't always going to be effective in the long run because it's not going to change how you think about the actions you're taking. It's not going to change the thoughts you're, that you, you are having that are affecting the feelings that are causing you to take those actions that you're not liking anyway. And that's why so much of the work that we have to do when we're talking about health and fitness and nutritional changes and all the things that we work on really does start within the mind. And it starts with bringing awareness yeah. to a yeah. lot of otherwise, this. Otherwise a coach is just Google, right? Like, mm-hmm. like, yeah. Otherwise a coach is like, here's a diet, here's the workouts, you know, yeah. go work with chat. Your GPT, you're good. No, 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 no. A coach is a guide. A coach is a guide and asking questions allows a good coach to know how to guide you in the right direction. It also allows you to see for yourself, maybe, where the right or wrong direction is. And that's, mm-hmm. uh, that's worth its weight in gold. I mean, as a, I remember as a trainer, you know, I really started to figure this out when I would work with clients 
the first time this happened, I had a client, young lady who was uh, recovered anorexic and her mom was my client. And so she hired me to train her daughter and uh, her daughter had a therapist. And so I said, I, I, I should probably get on the phone with the therapist just to like, touch base and see like if there's things I should do, shouldn't do. I had no experience aside from my own, uh, you know, dysfunctional uh, relationship with food at that point. Um, like, okay, what do I say? What do I do? And I got on the phone and, and you know, she blew my mind with, uh, you know, how, how to approach this, how to communicate, that kind of stuff. And then, in the, you know, through the years, when clients, I would always notice when clients worked with me and then they worked with a therapist, okay, um, the success rate went through the roof. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, this, this is a lot more than just exercise biomechanics and workout programming and macros. Like, what are they doing? What are they talking them through? And, and how are they guiding them um, through this process? That's what a coach does. A coach is guiding you through this process. A coach is not just giving you the answers of what to do or what not to do. If that was the case, and then uh, the success rate would be, we'd be robots, right? Here, plug this in. You're good. I'm, you know, we're humans. We're emotional, complex uh, creatures and our relationship to our bodies, ourselves, and then as an extension, exercise and nutrition is very, you know, it's very complex. I mean, uh, just uh, look at, look at the foods that you have that you might have favorite foods from childhood that you have a fond memory of where objectively you could step away and be like, that's actually not very tasty. But for some reason, I like that because when I was home from, you know, from, from school sick, my mom would always buy this, whatever thing, or my aunt would make this food or, you know, I have this, whatever. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, or, or just look at the, the, you know, the connections people have in different cultures. Uh, to food. Um, so, and that's just food, you know, exercise is another one. You know, I'll give you another, I'll, I'll give you another one, right? Another good example. You guys obviously work out and have, have done so for a while. When you first start exercising, um, the pain from the exercise, even when appropriate, can sometimes feel unbearable, right? Like I, I've had clients, I, had, I remember one time, the first time this happened, I had a woman doing a tricep press down, very simple, basic exercise. And I remember she was doing the press down, and then she let go of the bar and the slap, the, the, the stack slammed. And I said, oh, my God, what's the matter? She's like, uh, it hurts. I'm like, oh, did you get hurt? And she's like, well, it hurts back here. And I, I'm like, and I, so I had her move her arm and I said, does it hurt now? She goes, no. I said, oh, that's just, it's just the burning. That's the pain that comes from the exercise. And she said, oh, okay. She goes, well, I guess when you've been working out as long as you have, you, you know, you probably don't hurt anymore. And I said, no, actually, I probably my workouts probably hurt more now than they did when I first started because I'm more advanced and I can push myself harder and it's more appropriate. And then it, it dawned on me, I just have a different relationship with that pain. I have a different relationship with how the workout feels. It's still hard, but I did have a different relationship with that that hard, with that mm. pain. Now, now, you know, not to get too esoteric, but think about the carryover or the, you know, how that bleeds into the rest of our lives. But that's a relationship with exercise, right? Now, you know, going back to the I hate myself, um, you know, the, the more pain you feel, even inappropriate pain, if you hate yourself, it's cathartic. That's what I get. That's what I deserve. Mm. Um, but when you start to develop a better relationship, now the pain can fluctuate and sometimes a workout's harder. Sometimes it's easier. Sometimes I need, I, I should have a hard workout or I, a hard workout is right for me. I feel good. I slept good. I'm going to go for a PR. I'm going to really perform. Other times it's like, man, I'm getting no sleep. My daughter's waking up all night or I'm too much stress. And uh, I need to not feel too much pain in this workout. In fact, I just need to feel better. I just need to feel good throughout this workout. So I think I'm going to do mobility, uh, maybe go in the steam room or maybe just go for a walk type of deal. So um, it, it allows you, uh, your relationship to exercise is also part of this. But when you develop that relationship, then what happens is your, your, your workouts are always appropriate and they always improve the quality of your life because you can mm -hmm. modify them, change them based off of what's going on. And it's, it is a relationship. This is something, if you do this right, right if you're starting out right now and you're, you're trying to lose weight, you're trying to get in shape, you hire, uh, you know, a coach and you're working with them. If you do everything right, right, if everything goes perfectly, this you're gonna be doing this forever. You're gonna be doing this hopefully until the day you die that you die on a weekly basis, uh, multiple times a week, right? So this is a relationship. So let's start it the right way if you're gonna be married to this thing for the rest of your life.
hundred percent. And I love what you were saying about, you know, even like with pain where it's, it's not about that the pain goes away because we, you know, get better at exercising or even like the pain of the struggles of making nutritional changes, like eating healthier. Like we agree sometimes when we're just, you know, wanting to have the pizza, have the, the birthday cake, like you want to actually be able to enjoy your life and it doesn't become necessarily easier. It's more of that you stop essentially allowing the the pain quote unquote to affect you as much it just doesn't become as big of a deal at that no, point in time and, and and again we need a more complete picture of uh of the things that bring us real value um in life mm-hmm. you know struggle and challenges it's a big part of it like I, I here's a scenario that i've painted many times on the podcast right imagine taking a helicopter ride to the top of mount everest and they get you to the top and you get out and you look at the view it's gorgeous like impactful wow this is amazing would that even come close to comparing to the value that actually climbing Mount Everest and accomplishing that would provide you? Um, what did that come from? The struggle, the challenge. Um, and so once you start to kind of figure this out and exercise and nutrition is a great way to, to start. Um, cause it's, like I said, it's bleeds in everything else. Um, then you, you, you get this natural balance cause there is value in, in, in hedonistic things. Like, right? uh, you know, like, eating things that are really tasty. That, that's a value. I'm not going to deny that. I mean, for God's sakes, I'm a, a first generation Italian American, I, you know, food for us is, is everything. I, I enjoy food for its, for the taste and the value, you know, and, and for that as well, but that's not the only value. There's a lot of, so if we, if we create this complete picture through this process, and I, I do, I do want to say this, uh, it, it is not as long as you think, I think a lot of people are like, oh my God, it's going to take me 12 years to, no, it's actually, it's a snowball effect. So that first step you make is typically a small challenging one that you feel like you can sustain forever, especially when you're not motivated. That's kind of the context. But then when that becomes a habit, you, uh, you, you make another step and you find another one that's challenging, but one that you think is sustainable for the rest of your life. But what happens through the process is the space between the steps gets smaller. And the steps themselves become larger and you start to develop this momentum and this skill. Or I, I've trained so many people. Um, this was about the back half of my career. Let me just paint that context. In the, begin- the first half of my career, this was not true. But the back half of my career, I trained so many people that had no interest in becoming fitness fanatics. They had no interest in the becoming trainers or whatever. Uh, they were all regular people trying to improve their health, but I trained all of them and got them to the point where now, I mean, here we are, you know, I I haven't trained a single person for, you know, 10 years. Uh, they're still consistent. They're still doing it. Um, it's, it's something that they do. It's a part of their life. Um, and they develop that, uh, through that process and they never stopped. They never stopped. Yeah. And I think something to add to, um, to, to your point of, you know, the pain or the struggle or whatever, I mean, you know, time is going to pass either way. Right. And however you choose to invest your time, your efforts and, and what it is that you focus your life on, you know, that's totally up to you, but you get to choose your hard too. It, it, and it's like you said earlier, you know, it's whether you have a bad relationship with yourself when you call yourself, you know, fat, ugly, gross, whatever, or you actually get yourself to do the things that are potentially a little painful and get you out of your comfort zone first. And then you, you, you reap the benefits you, from that too. You, you know, here's the other part of that too, with exercise, same thing with workouts. Uh, the value that we've placed on workouts begins and ends at the scale. This is where people mm-hmm. think the value is. Am I losing weight? Am I losing weight? That means it's successful. This is how, um, how twisted this, this has become. Like you'll have a client who is sleeping worse their hormones are off, they're losing hair because they're overtraining, they're under eating, or they lost their period or whatever, but their scale's going down and they're like, yes, I, I'm moving in the right direction, right? Or you'll have another client who sleeping better, better libido, feels healthier, less pain, but the scale went up a pound. Oh my God, my whole day is completely ruined. And it's not because people are dumb. It's because people are are they're 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 basing this relationship off the only the, the very little minimal information that they're focusing on, because exercise can it make you gain or lose weight? Yeah, it can. But you know what else it can do? Improve your energy, make you sleep better. It's the most powerful period. End of story. Antidepressant, anxiolytic, anything that exists. That's the data it shows that quite clearly. It's a pain reliever, right? It takes away chronic pain, as you learned 
to move better. Um, it improves your cognitive function. This is also a fact. It improves your, your, your moods in the sense that you're less likely to feel negative. You're more likely to feel positive. Like there's a whole host of incredible benefits. Now imagine and this, I, this is what I used to do as a trainer. I would help my client, uh, you know, make, connect those dots. I would help them. Well, how was your sleep? How are you feeling today? Well, you know what? It's weird, Sal. I'm drinking less coffee these days. Oh, wow. What do you mean? Well, I think I just have more energy. Oh, that's amazing. How, how's your sleep? I'm not waking up in the middle of the night. Wow. I'm, I'm sleeping better. Um, you know how your knee pain, uh, it's gone. I feel so much better. You know, you, you, you start to connect those dots. Now they look at exercise and it's like, oh my God, like this, this is making everything better. And then the scale goes up or down. I mean, that's just a reflection of your health, which, you know, it's a wonderful kind of side effect. But if that's all you care about, which is what a lot of people care about, because that's what they think the value or just how they look, they're going to miss out on all these incredible things. And they're shooting themselves in the foot, right? So if you, if you base it off of all off of the mirror and the scale, you're very likely to do the wrong things, which also means you will not accomplish the scale weight or the look that you're looking for. That's the whole paradox of this. It's like focus only on that. You're not going to get that. By the way, you're also going to lose all these other things uh, as well. So again, we got to communicate this uh, loudly and effectively uh, so that the, so that the people in our space who do, who do it the wrong way, the consumers educated enough to where, cause look, I'll tell you what, you put me head to head against somebody that sells it the wrong way in long format. Okay. Not Instagram clips. That's by the way, way we have a podcast. And why we didn't just start an Instagram company. You've got to be able to communicate this. Put me on a podcast next to the fitness charlatan or whatever and have everyday people listen to it. And within 30 to 45 minutes, everyone's going to be like, oh, God, like that guy is correct. This other person, they're lying or that's not going to work. Um, and so I think if we do this enough, it's going to become um, financially uh, unsuccessful for people to do this. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to make it so that if you sell it the wrong way and you, and you lie to people, you'll make no money. Cause I know that that's what drives markets. hundred percent. And I think the consumers are becoming more educated. I mean, thanks to, you know, probably a lot of the, the mission that you guys have led and mind pump and really, I think normalizing these types of messages that like, Hey, we can create successful lucrative businesses while doing things the right way and while actually taking care of people and actually having their best interest at heart. And I think you guys really have been a big part of paving the way for that in the industry for, you know, for coaches like ours, um, our business here, it really is helpful to hear you guys having these messages and being able to stand behind that as well. But I know there's still obviously, you know, eh, every day, it seems like there's a new diet, new yeah. fad, new thing that's being pushed and supplements, you know, yeah, new supplement. the diet industry is, you know, humongous and we may never completely take it down but we can all stand up and say the right things use quality education and help just empower the consumer yeah. to make the right decisions for themselves well it's it's uh there's a lot of good i'm seeing a lot of positive changes but i will say this when it comes to diet i'd never seen this before um uh, you know in the first you know, 15 years or 20 years in the space i'd never there's always been, you know, lies around diet and people are weird about nutrition. They get kind of this religious, you know, fervor around it. Like, how dare you talk about my diet that way, whatever. But I'd never seen uh, diets become politicized and I'd never seen, except for maybe veganism, you, you used to see this because real vegans, and I say real vegans in the sense that um, when you look at the data, people who try to go vegan for health reasons, they fall off like any other diet. There's no, the success rate's the same as whatever diet. But real vegans are people like really don't want to hurt animals, really think it's wrong. So that's a different category, right? But besides that, which was a small category of people, still is, diets are starting to become politicized and they're starting to become either moral or immoral. Mm -hmm. So now it's like this diet is bad for the environment. This diet will kill the earth. This diet is, you know, whatever. And you're starting to get propaganda. I'd never seen this before. Funded by... Pharma, government, you, who knows? And, and they're taking data and twisting it. And there's weird headlines. And I just saw one uh, the other day. It's like a high protein diet may lead to um, uh, more heart uh, issues or something like that. It's, it's like, and then it okay, well, wasn't right. it with protein shakes that were like just 
terrible fillers and all the things <laughs> that's not was even, how that's they, not, they measured that it. Wasn't, that wasn't even it. It was all based off of mTOR, which is a signaler mm. of of muscle growth uh, that can also make cancer grow, but in a cancer environment, it'll make cancer grow. By the way, so will protein, so will carbohydrates. So will anything that makes cells grow will make cancer grow when you have cancer. So it was, it's just, what they did is they took something, twisted it, and they're, and they're selling it in a very strange uh, yeah. kind of way. Um, so now I'm, I'm seeing that. So now the battle is, is getting very interesting. But I say to them, bring it on. Like, because I'll tell you what, uh, the best possible thing, the best possible odds we have at improving our environment uh, or solving the world's problems, okay? It's always been this, by the way is smart, innovative, productive people. And if we if we want healthy, the healthier people are, the more productive and innovative they are. And if we push people towards a diet that's gonna make people less healthy, which is what they're what a lot of these, these messages are trying to do and that what will happen, we're gonna end up with less innovation. We'll end up with less people to solve uh, big problems. So I I, 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 I I dare them to do that as well, bring it on. but. It, it, the battle's still going on, and we're seeing it from a lot of different angles. It's just weird to see the the political angle of diet. I never thought they would touch that. Mm. And it's a powerful message for us to wrap up on here, Sal. I know you you do have a hard stop time. We don't want to take up too much of your time here, but you know, before we let you go, I, I think if our listeners hadn't already heard of you, if they hadn't already heard of Mind Pump, I'm sure that they're going to be tuning in soon after all the wisdom you've already dropped in here, but. I also wanted to give you an opportunity. I know there are many ways for our listeners to continue to learn more from you, including, you know, the resistance training revolution book. Um, is there anything that you want to share that might help anybody who is maybe getting started on their journey or maybe they're feeling stuck? Maybe they aren't really sure what's the best way to have some of these sustainable results that you've alluded to. Where could they learn from you and continue to kind of gather some of your expertise? Well, the, be the, the best place is the podcast, and you can find us anywhere the podcast, that podcasts are broadcast uh, or put out or on uh, YouTube. So our podcast is also shown on YouTube in, in video format. Um, but I'll say this to the people listening, um, and I, I'll stand by this all day long. Um, nothing's more effective um, than working with a, a good coach. There's not, nothing is going to be, there is no dollar you can invest that's going to give you more back than working with a coach, however often you can, uh, whether that's once a month, even. Um, having a guide there to walk you through the process, to help you through the the journey and the stumbling blocks and the mental hurdles and the challenges and the questions and all this other information you're going to get, this noise, a good coach or trainer, you're going to have the best possible success uh, forever uh, by working with someone. So if you're, if, if you're serious about this and you're like, I want to do this the right way and I want to do this in a way where I, I, I feel good and I enjoy it and I can do this for the rest of my life. Hire yourself a coach uh, that that knows what they're doing. That it's they're they're worth their weight in gold. Well, appreciate the the encouragement there, but um, thank you so much, Sal, for your time today. We really appreciate it. And you know, as we we mentioned at the beginning, this is a dream come true for us to be able to have this conversation with you and to be able to share your knowledge with the women that listen to our podcast as well. But thank you so much, everybody, for listening and for tuning in. We'll be back next week with another great episode.